<laughs> so, over the past month, there have been tons of little tidbits swirling around regarding AMD's Phoenix APU as we get closer to its launch. And in fact, I must admit that this leak may come out mere days before official benchmarks from a couple of channels that get Phoenix stuff early, and it does make me wish I would have leaked what I'm talking about today sooner. You see, what I'm leaking today I actually had a couple of weeks ago, but at face value, it didn't really impress me, and so I decided I've got a lot of other stuff to talk about in leak a couple weeks ago, and so... Unless I can nail down exactly what Phoenix model I'm looking at and what TDP it's running at, I don't think this is worth talking about because I don't want to draw bad conclusions. And, well, today I actually figured out what's going on, I believe, and it actually does seem moderately impressive. And so, well, let's get right into it. So, yeah, what you're looking at here is a heavily redacted, 3D Mark Time Spy score of a Phoenix APU. And I did block out even the last number in each of the graphics and CPU scores, so you can't exactly tie it back to my source. It's one of my best sources. It's got me some incredible stuff over the past year, and I'm just not jeopardizing this guy for my own selfish reasons and because I really also don't want anyone to get in trouble. But yeah, if you look at this graphic score, you can probably see right away why I wasn't that impressed. But then, today actually, I looked at that engineering sample number and dug around online, and I discovered that this is almost assuredly an R7 7840HS, not the R9 model, meaning that this is clocked lower by default at all aligned TDPs compared to the flagship, and that also, well, I remember that my source told me this was actually a 25-watt limited variant as well, and a lot of the more impressive Phoenix scores leaking we're almost assuredly in models using far more energy. And so, yeah, if you actually line this up to the 25-watt Phoenix leaks we saw a month ago, it's a slight improvement. And if you look at what Rembrandt actually uses at this level of power consumption, I find that this is actually performing nearly 30% better. Yes, Rembrandt can perform around the graphics score that I'm leaking today in this video, but only when it's using double the energy, TDP to TDP, this thing performs at least around 20 to 30% better. And in fact, one of the fans on the Moore's Law's Dead Discord whipped out his 680M laptop today that was also limited limited to 25 watts, and this performed over 30% better than his Rembrandt APU. So yeah, that's actually pretty impressive. At the same TDPs, there are scenarios that I can leak today where Phoenix is at least 30% better. And additionally, this is the R7 model, not the R9 model. So you could conceive of some really, really heavily pushed Phoenix APUs getting over 30 or 35%, maybe even 40% in the right scenarios. And that would place this thing, because again, remember this has improved over what we saw over a higher end model a month ago, this could place the R9 Phoenix models somewhere close to an RTX 2050, which is around a 1650. Uh, that's really not that bad, actually, and that will bring a nice performance uplift to integrated graphics uh, this year in laptops. And look, I know that some people are going to be disappointed by these results today. I have a feeling that many of you were hoping for triple-digit performance increases in the integrated graphics, not double-digit based on some, well, some exceptionally bad leaks from some fake leakers last year. But it is what it is, and it is impressive when you consider that AMD is doing this with a new APU that, yes, is on a smaller node than its predecessor, but using a smaller die and using just the same dual-dim DDR5 setup as before, that's, that's a solid improvement. But I do want to talk about realistic APU expectations today and also leak some information about whether or not AMD will be using Vcash in some of its upcoming models. But first, an ad from a sponsor. Getting your daily vitamins can be tricky. Sometimes it can feel like you're just chewing on random stuff all over the house in hopes of getting the vitamins you need. Or at least maybe that's what Jessie's doing. I really don't know what she's doing half the time. But that's not an issue for me. I have found Athletic Greens. This piece of content is sponsored by Athletic Greens, who makes a fantastic nutritional drink, AG1, that acts as a tasty daily micro habit that makes it easy for you to absorb key nutrients, lead a healthy lifestyle, and feel your best no matter what the day holds. And no matter if you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free, all of Athletic Greens products, including AG1, fit these diets. Since I received Athletic Greens, I've been experimenting with it too. And at this point, I do myself take 
cake, half a serving twice a day, and I honestly didn't intend for this to happen. But over time, I've replaced my first cup of coffee in the morning and my last glass of wine at night with AG1, and it's because it tastes good and it has just created this calming effect on me that's yet energizing in the morning, and it genuinely makes it easier for me to go to bed or to wake up. Maybe it's the vitamin K2, manganese, B12, zinc, and other energizing products waking me up. Maybe it's the B6 and magnesium and other brain health ingredients helping me go to sleep. But either way, I genuinely do recommend Athletic Greens products and especially their AG1 drink. Use my link below and get a one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D3K2 and five travel packs free with your first purchase. Even just clicking on this link helps the channel a ton and getting Athletic Greens products through this link helps me even more. Support Moore's Law Z and support your health by trying Athletic Greens today. Anyways, like I said before the break, if you're disappointed by Phoenix's integrated graphics performance, I'm sorry, but I was very outspoken last year that people should not be expecting ridiculous things like 3060 performance out of this little APU or any elaborate ridiculous chiplet design that's already been debunked by AMD. Some fake leakers have even deleted themselves over those bad leaks by now, while others just continue to pinch off bullshit weekly for clicks. Don't give them clicks, just pay attention to the stuff that's reasonable. And yeah, expecting this 15 to 40% performance increase at lower TDPs is reasonable. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I could totally believe that at some point this year or something, there will be a 6,000 megahertz paired, 3.2 gigahertz overclocked model that is at 95 watts, maybe a desktop release or, or something of Phoenix that could bring you something maybe closer to 1660 performance, maybe. But overall, I really think that people should just expect 1650 Max-Q or maybe RTX 2050 performance out of integrated Phoenix graphics. And hey, that means that now AMD will be able to brag that their integrated graphics are as good as a 1650 laptop without, for some reason, only giving their chip FSR in the benchmarks, even though the 1650 can use FSR. That was really weird. Now AMD doesn't have to do bizarre things like that to make their integrated graphics look impressive. And I actually do think this is totally enough performance for solid 1080p 60 gaming with medium or low settings or maybe high or ultra if you turn on FSR to finish the job. And remember that this uses RDNA 3, and I've leaked that AMD is working on a new version of FSR that can be leveraged by RDNA 3, so that should be coming eventually, hopefully as well, further buoying the performance of this new APU. And finally, on the performance, honestly guys, the 7900 XTX had 20% more compute units than the 6950 XT, and it was like, what, 40% stronger if we're being generous to RDNA 3? This has the same amount of compute units as I leaked last year compared to Rembrandt. It didn't have some crazy compute unit increase like other fake leakers said. And so if it has the same amount of compute units as last gen, or at least depending on how you look at it, same amount of work groups, then yeah, a 20% at least performance increase is pretty good. And might this become bigger if AMD fixes their drivers this summer? Maybe. But at least for now, all we can go on is the RDNA 3 stuff that's launched, and this outcome is totally what people should have expected. And I know there is an elephant in the room this week. Recent 7950X3D iGPU performance benchmarks from PC World gave people hope that maybe some incredible stuff was coming, especially if you add Vcash to an APU. And look, when I saw those PC World benchmarks, at first I was impressed, or really the first word that comes to mind is confused by how big the gains were. But then I thought about it for just five seconds and decided to look into if this is really that impressive compared to what Intel's graphics were getting. You see, when I looked around, I found that a 12 compute unit model of Rembrandt is typically at least 60% better than the 96 execution unit model from Intel, sometimes even twice as good. And so, well, do you see where this is going? If AMD's 12 compute unit model is 60 to 100% better than Intel's 96 execution unit graphics, then AMD has, you know, a two compute unit model that's around Intel's 32. That actually lines up exactly with where you would expect the performance to be, relatively speaking. And then if you consider that the integrated graphics in desktop Zen 4, just those two compute units, have far less L1 and less L2 cache per work group compared to Rembrandt, 
It would be believable that maybe putting Vcash on the chip had an outsized effect on its performance increase. Well, until you realize that websites are coming out and saying those benchmarks seem to be bad. So, yeah, I would just say at a minimum, those results you saw at PC World, they were about a fourth to a sixth the performance of Rembrandt, which is what you should expect out of a sixth the compute units. They're not impressive at face value. And even if the Vcash doesn't... Uh, it, you should just probably ignore them. The fact of the matter is that AMD builds their APUs with extra L2 cache per compute unit to make up for the fact that they have less. Well, they don't have GDR6 or a bunch of Infinity cache to power it, but they do have extra L2 cache. And AMD isn't building their APUs to be too weak for what they're meant to do. And so, guys, I am communicating today something that I actually leaked already last year, that Phoenix, it's built to have the performance it's going to have. If it gets any better performance this year, it's because AMD fixed RDNA 3 and its drivers. It's not because it actually needs any extra cash. I even reached out to a AMD source today to double check this and was told once again that, yeah, Phoenix can't use Vcash. Dragon Range can. But that's it. And so if you see any Vcash laptop models this year, it's not going to be because Phoenix can use chiplets or Vcash. It's going to be because they're just upping the CPU performance with that Raphael-based APU they're also using in laptops. And, well, look, guys, I understand there's a hunger for powerful integrated graphics, something that can bring solid 1080p or even 1440p 60 gaming to notebooks while saving costs by not having to allocate extra room for a dedicated GPU, its VRAM, and its cooling, while then giving you decent gaming without even plugging your laptop into the wall. But it's just not easy. The more I look into it, for AMD to make something like that, cost effective and something OEMs want to jump on board with, right? So if you made, let's say like a 200 millimeter squared APU, and then you threw Vcash on top of it to make up for the lack of, you know, Infinity Cache or GDDR6, you know, like with that Vcash basically acting as Infinity Cache, you have to understand that adding that layer of cash on top of the APU, I was told today, adds about $15 to $25 in cost, which doesn't sound like a lot. But, you know, an MX graphics card really only costs 30 to 40 bucks at this point, I believe. So you're adding about, let's just call it $20 to the cost of a chip that if you added $40 could just get a small integrated graphics anyways. And most... 14-inch form factors are built to take a small graphics card anyways. So basically, AMD, if they ever want to go for this mega APU strategy, it probably doesn't make sense for it to be a giant die size. At that point, you could just use a dedicated graphics card and an APU. It would basically have to be something 200 millimeter squared or less so that they can put it into those ultra thin and light 14 and 13-inch form factors that don't have room to add a graphics card, but then outperform everything else around it so they don't have to design some new thing because the second amd makes the apu too big they could probably just put a smaller cpu and gpu next to it and save money or have similar performance without having to redo the entire design of this big laptop and then if you make it ultra small well then you better make dang sure it actually has a notable amount more performance than the other small stuff and that's what i believe if amd ever goes for a dedicated APU for thin and light gaming, it's going to almost assuredly be something that fits into those Ultrabook no GPU laptops, but gives you the latest 50 graphics performance, not 1650, not 2050, not 3050. Lovelace is out. It would have to be close to a 4050 and fit into laptops that don't have room for a graphics card without too much work from the OEM. That is what I believe would get OEMs super excited because they could take their existing thing that couldn't do things before, but now can do things that their larger stuff is already doing. And yeah, I think they might jump on that. But I don't think AMD is quite ready to do that. And that's a surgical strike they've got to get perfectly. And they probably won't be able to until Strix at the earliest, which I guess that's the last little tidbit I'm going to drop here today. I've already talked about in Broken Silicon that I know of at least three different Strix variants. Strix 1, Strix 2, and Strix 3. Just like there's Phoenix 1 and Phoenix 2. There's three Strixes that I'm aware of at least so far. And because of that, because there's multiple models, it wouldn't surprise me if AMD did allow one of them to use Vcash, whereas Phoenix cannot. But at the end of the day, I can tell you right now that it does not sound like AMD is sure about if they want to do that yet or not. Now, 
Do not take that from this video to me and Moore's Law is Dead confirms AMD's thinking about doing it. I mean, I guess that means they are if they're leaning one way or the other. But most of all, what I'm saying is it doesn't seem like behind the scenes yet that AMD's super excited about one model being this, you know, solo gaming APU with Vcash yet. Might they make that a possibility for one of the district experience? Yes, but that decision has not been made yet. And it's for the complicated reasons I already communicated a few weeks ago. And uh, yeah, I think that's going to do it for this video. I leaked what you should expect out of AMD Phoenix performance. You know, it's CPU is going to be like about 20% better than Rembrandt and gaming, maybe a bit better at other things. And it's graphics at the right TDPs, somewhere 15 to 40% better. So that, that that's impressive, but it doesn't have Vcash and it's not going to bring you a triple digit performance increase in integrated graphics. And you're going to have to wait for Strix at least for that to maybe even be a possibility because it's got to be perfect if AMD goes for it. But yeah, so if you like this video, please make sure you like it. Uh, please make sure you're subscribed, that you ring the bell button. You know, if you want to support Moore's Law is Dead, check out Athletic Greens and their AG1 product. I actually am very excited to include that in this video today because I really do like that product quite a bit. Even just clicking on that link helps. And if you have the extra money, support us on Patreon. Uh, we can't do this without our patrons. You get early ad-free uh, podcasts, exclusive podcasts. Uh, Brian Heemskirk, a game developer, is coming on to talk about the latest uh, console PC ports, what's going on with game engines and Zen 4 X3D and other upcoming products from these companies as well. He's a fan favorite. If you're a patron, you can ask him questions. But for everybody else, no matter what, thank you for watching. <laughs>